Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Proceeding in Trust, Building a Model Payer Provider Value Scorecard on Open Data. I am Mackenzie Bean with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. Anish Chopra will be moderating this webinar today. He is the president of Care Journey, an open data membership service building a trusted, transparent rating system for physicians, networks, facilities, and markets on the move to value. He served as the first U.S. Chief Technology Officer under President Obama, and in 2014 authored Innovative State, How New Technologies Can Transform Government. Please welcome Anish Chopra. Thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation and for all of you to spend a few moments with us uh, this afternoon. I'll say more about COVID in a moment, uh, but wanted to just briefly uh, introduce uh, our panelists for today's presentation. Uh, we are blessed and honored to have uh, Diana joining us from uh, Next Level Health. Uh, she has, uh, we'll, we'll provide proper introductions when we get to the panels themselves, but uh, both experience on the payer side and the provider side. Uh, Rod has kindly joined us from Mercy Health uh, uh, Physicians, which is going to describe a bit of a at-large provider network. And then uh, we're going to have a tag team uh, from our friends at Privia Health uh, with Mark and Greg, uh, sharing a bit more of the national context. Uh, on the topic that we'll be diving deeper on momentarily. Uh, just a, a brief introduction to the work we do at Care Journey. As uh, Mackenzie just alluded, uh, we spend the bulk of our time focusing on the use of openly available health data to inform decisions around uh, network uh, development, uh, improving the performance of networks, and increasingly to improve uh, the clinical protocols to identify interventions that might materially improve particular patient segments, and we'll speak about all of these in the course of today's uh, discussion. But obviously, what is hanging on all of our minds is uh, the challenges confronting the healthcare delivery system uh, with respect to COVID-19. I wanted to share just a moment or two about the uh, circumstances in which we find ourselves right now. Number one, on Wednesday of last week, the Centers for Disease Control published the very first report on the 4,000 plus cases that had been submitted for evaluation. The good news is we quickly turned around as a country some of this uh, initial uh, feedback about risk factors and uh, uh, mortality rates and other uh, really important uh, health uh, considerations. But a footnote in the uh, scorecard from last week is what drew my attention and what would relate to this uh, topic of today's session, and that is that the underlying information on those 4,000 plus cases was sadly incomplete. Our Centers for Disease Control in reviewing those case reports found that for a third of all of those submitted cases, there was no indication as to whether the patient was hospitalized or not. For nearly half of the reported cases, there was no indication as to whether the patient was admitted to the ICU or sadly uh, had, had died on account of the uh, illness. And shockingly, even for the most rudimentary of information categories, uh, patient's age, even that was empty on roughly 9% of the reported cases. This sobering state of affairs after a decade of digitizing the electronic, the, the uh, healthcare delivery system uh, is frustrating on a personal level and tragic in, in, in thinking about our nation's capacity to deal with COVID. Uh, just a brief note on this, um, my successor, the Chief Technology Officer in the Trump Administration has formally issued a call to action, has begun tapping into the expertise of the country on improving our data uh, there are three areas in which I am working hand-in-hand uh, -hand on these issues and would welcome anyone's participation. Uh, the first is to get sure that we have uh, trusted, openly available data on the front end. That takes the form of uh, 
health, health systems that put up uh, websites that describe what's happening with coronavirus. Uh, Google and Microsoft last week announced instructions on how those web in, uh, websites can more explicitly uh, surface COVID-related information that's completely free and available for anyone. We have to improve that public health reporting to the point I just outlined, and there are a number of initiatives around that that can be taken to get uh, adoption this week. And then more longer term, we're trying to figure out ways to strengthen the clinical uh, EHR-based information streams that can inform uh, future responses, maybe even wave two or three. Uh, uh, we'll see what happens in this circumstance. So happy to just take that as a moment and, and, and uh, welcome anyone to, to participate. Today's session essentially builds on some of that open data conversation, but mostly towards the payer-provider relationship and explicitly looking for ways in which we can improve the governance of payer-provider relationships as we move to value-based contracts, to think about openly available data sets for benchmarking purposes, and to explore clinical protocols that might traverse the payer and provider community so that certain segments of the population get the services uh, that, were, that have been proven to deliver value. To get there, I thought I would just spend a few more minutes and then turn to our, our panelists in the following way. The current state of affairs, uh, there are you know, rudimentary to sophisticated uh, governance models between payers and providers. We're going to spend a few minutes uh, running a bit deeper on the anatomy of a payer-provider contracting organization and a contract vehicle. Number two, I call this nothing but metrics. Uh, the good or the bad of our digitization uh, decade is that uh, lots of organizations have uh, requests for information that sources originally in a digital format. The problem is they want it in their own way. So we'll talk a bit about uh, the fact that we've got a, plura a, a plethora of measures today that organizations have to uh, report out and in many cases, the administrative burden feels like it exceeds the, the material marginal value of each incremental metric. And then last but not least, uh, it remains a, a frustration to share information from the clinical networks to the, provide, to the payer community and vice versa. The good news is there are these three trends that are fueling a new chapter in these relationships. The first, of course, is that we're moving faster on the move to value. I serve on one of the uh, Healthcare Learning and Action Network committees focused on strengthening the technical and administrative infrastructure. And you could see that the Healthcare Learning and Action Network, a public-private partnership launched by CMS, has absolutely put a stake in the ground for a multi-payer commitment to alternative payment model uh, adoption across all segments of the health uh, insurance community. Uh, second, the modernization of uh, interoperability, the rules that just became final about a month and a half ago, have explicit implications for payer-provider data sharing. And last but not least, the government itself is playing a lead role in opening up aggregate information, particularly to help with benchmarking. So let's just send a word on uh, the latter two, and then we'll turn to our, uh, again to our colleagues. A quick summary of the interoperability rules and the open data policies of the administration. First, the interoperability rules put the burden of implementation today on the shoulders of health plans. I call this payers up first. The rules require health plans to open up claims data and patient clinical data in a standardized format, for, the, for those of you on the line who are technical in nature, this is the FHIR API standard, version 4. And that health plans, COVID uh, crisis notwithstanding, this may be delayed, but for now, the deadline is listed as January 1, 2021, next January. Health plans have to publish this information at a minimum to consumers and their designated applications. By 2022, that capability must also be available in bulk to share with other health plans and potentially, and partly for this discussion, with, with provider networks. The second provision in the rule is that uh, payers and providers have to have the technical capacity to move their health information 
from consumer apps to partners. And so if I look at these two components together, payers going first and the bulk infrastructure requirements, the specific implications for the community are as follows. I'm guessing over the next 12 months, health plans will be knocking on the door of their clinical network partners, asking that those partners deliver patient information to them in the FHIR version 4 format. In other words, the demand signal for standards-based data sharing will move from the government mandating it to payers on behalf of a response to a government mandate, driving some of that specific demand signal. I believe that will happen this calendar year. In addition, I believe the uh, – uh, sorry, I think the slides are moving a little bit here. Uh, forgive me. Uh, okay. Uh, specifically, the, uh, uh, the technical ability to move the uh, single patient export to the bulk uh, relationship, that is to say for a full population, that technology is available for testing today but isn't required of the EHR vendors until 2022. So we have a bit of a year or two of testing before we can see that uh, capability scaling. I also wanted to highlight that the Trump administration has been building on the progress of the Obama administration and adding more data sets for public access and benchmarking. Most notably, Medicare Advantage Encounters data that was made available last year for the years 2015 and 2016, and now for the first time ever, Medicaid Encounters data released for the years 2014, 15, and 16. So with all of that, uh, CMS finds itself serving as a model payer for these uh, 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 kind of collaborative agreements. As we speak, uh, every health plan, sorry, every uh, Part D plan, every uh, Medicare ACO, and every consumer designated app can request claims history in a standardized FHIR format from CMS using these modern interoperability techniques. You can see a screenshot of one of our members, Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, that's built an app natively in their EHR that allows the doctors to tap the Medicare feed for four years of claims history to help close the gaps between encounters uh, uh, that were outside of the network combined with what's inside the, F the EHR system at their platform. Uh, we at Care Journey are working with a number of our members to use that Medicare database to serve as a benchmarking uh, uh, resource. So here you can see a network evaluating their cost measures. Uh, think of this as a version of a joint operating committee uh, review board, in this case using Medicare fee-for-service as a proxy, enabling uh, the opportunity to understand why uh, cost trends in certain categories like the outpatient category might be growing faster in your network relative to the market average, extending that on issues of utilization where a deeper dive into the network might suggest that a reason inpatient utilization rates per thousand are lower at, in, at network A versus the market average could be uh, because of the reduction uh, in readmissions. And, and you can see that uh, readmission rate calculation Again, allowing you to not only measure what's happening in the network, but to benchmark around uh, those to your side. And then certainly an emerging area of focus, the opportunity to track clinical interventions for certain cohorts of the population that have evidence in the literature as having been best practice. Uh, we highlight here the use of transitional care management services after discharge, a paper written by Dr. Binman, uh, and Cox note that for patients discharged uh, with a full Medicare transitional care management service uh, generate roughly 9.7% savings compared to patients who do not access these uh, important services over the 60-day period post-discharge. And here you can see uh, benchmarking a network on its transitional care management performance, its annual wellness visit performance, its flu shot uh, compliance relative to market average. These are the kinds of data services and interoperability provisions that map into a governance model as we think about next generation payer provider relationships. And so we thought the ideal person to start this conversation is our friend uh, Diana Grant, 
who uh, is currently serving at Next Level Health, but had a, a prior role on the provider side. And Diana, welcome to the webinar. I thought we'd begin with you to share a few words about your background and your current role as Chief Medical Officer at Next Level Health. Again, thanks to everyone on the phone for being present today. And definitely as a clinician, I'm going to say always be safe. Um, I was happy to talk on this subject. For one, I'm a family practitioner by training and certification. Prior to coming to next level, I was on the provider end in a major system here in the Chicago metropolitan area, where I think we were on the forefront of doing that engagement around value-based payment and creating those governance models, whereas the practitioners sit around the table with the system. And together, we were able to go to the payer and have agreed upon matrix, again, referring to a lot of the CMS standards and what is already evidence-based in the community, of being able to set what those fees were and then how the providers would be compensated, not at a fee-for-service um, fee fee schedule uh, is what we've been living in. And I wanted to talk more about that government. And it was interesting with the title, trust, you have to create the provider trust because the provider is the one that has the relationship with the patient, the member, whatever you call that, that is a still sacred relationship, one of the few that we have in place. If that re relationship you create with the provider is of trust, he or she is then engaging on that governance board to talk about the different models that we can engage in. Uh, being on the provider end, very much so creating that board with providers being present, with equal say, uh, equal vote when decisions are being made, be it on the financial, clinical, and well as policy end of it. The other role that I play now is I am on the payer side, and I'm on the payer side when it comes to governmental programs, and that is of the Medicaid. And it depends on what state you are. You're probably farther down that curve that we talked about earlier in doing that reporting. We know the SARS report has been out there for Medicare Advantage, and now with many Medicaid plans, the various states are asking us to report. And that is becoming public knowledge on their website. Not only creating, quote, unquote, a SARS report around your respective state Medicaid program, but we can see each other's SARS reports. We're now uh, using our HEDIS matrix that is agreed upon and certain state matrix that may be just particular to your state and population. I think that's going to be important, having those conversations, creating what terms you're going to hear us talk about, joint operating committee, again, having those providers present in determining what those clinical matrix are, determining the policies, how we meet, how governance should take place. And that's at a very high level. And please, I will be open for more questions as we're moving forward. And I wanted you to know a yes, little bit about my health plan here, um, what our visions yes. are that we – yes, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I was just going to ask if you don't mind, just take us into a room uh, when, when some of these um, uh, conversations are taking place, and, and, and you can play the role of your current hat, which is as a payer, or your prior hat as a oh, provider. Yeah. A little bit of uh, lessons learned. Where are the typical areas of friction? I presume these meetings are not always uh, kumbaya and happy, happy. Oh. Are, are there areas where Maybe they're asking information that you don't think is useful and, and it's difficult to produce. And then conversely, you're asking them for guidance about how you can actually make the network work. Get, get, what, take us into the room where it happens, so to speak, Diana. Precisely. In that room, providers are at different levels. Providers in that room may have different EMR 
to share information. So one provider is there who may not have the latest um, and greatest tool. So he or she can do the recording to have the data in place. Also in the room, data is as good as it is trusted. Because if you give me data on my patients, the first thing I'm going to do as a provider, I'm working to disprove it. So you're going to have to come to that common ground. And that's when I talk about being in that joint operating committee. How are we going to exchange the data? Let that be agreed upon. If it's claims data, are you coding correctly? Are we, do we have those things agreed upon when we abstract that data? That's when we talk about the, the intensity of being in that room as it relates. Um, the analyzing, again, that environment that you're in, engaging with those partners. And I um, made this slide here so you could see how we could live with where the communities are, how you're engaging with them. What we decided to do with my present health plan is like minds, like partners. So we reached out to other governmental programs, i.e., like the Federally Qualified Health Centers, folks who had like responsibility to CMS, same reporting matrix. So you look for the like minds and based on your mission. And that's why I started this conversation, showing you our mission and our um, vision statement in place. Then you can see where that development of that collective strategy, how we're going to conduct it with our partners. And I think the fourth element I had there, reviewing the requirements and setting a task in that technical assistance. And sometimes there's a plan we're going to have to offer technical assistance to those providers. Again, creating that trust. Because if Diana, I don't know something, yep. else, yes, as a provider, I need to feel like you're going to help me and not be critical of it. And I think when we first started talking about value-based payment, a lot of providers just thought it was a different way to pay them less, to be honest. Yep. So they looked at it with a so, jaundiced eye. Yeah. And, and now that you're in the world, yeah, and Diana, this, this is extraordinarily helpful. As you think about the role you're in now, so you're having to be the one to earn the trust, are, are there yes. certain areas that you are hopeful, uh, you, know, re, you know, starting from scratch in a new, in a new plan environment, that, that, that might be lessons learned on how to, how to get there relatively quickly or there's no substitute for time. Tr trust is a complicated thing to earn, and I'm curious in the role yes. that you're playing now, is there any techniques you know, to earn it fast you know, in, in what is otherwise a, you know, a transactional life? And it's, it's almost as doing a due diligence on both sides of the table. The plan of the provider group has things to offer as well as the health plan i.e., this example, if I went to work with a FQAC and they already have in place a very robust community outreach group, identifying the members, bringing them in, uh, making sure they receive their primary visit, that may be incentivized for that group, not a bill per se service or maybe an access. Because we want to get the member in. We want the member to have the services they need. So when I say looking at the scope of service, the provider community is bringing to the table and then match up, what's your scope of service? Are you doing duplicated efforts? And I bet there are some health plans who have community outreach people. And we are trying to outreach the same folks and maybe the alignment of those efforts instead of the duplication. So when you earn trust, you're sitting down, you're doing your due diligence, looking at each other, cope with service, and how you can complement or become synergistic to the other one. The other example i like to share today is care coordination, that transitional care that you even spoke of 
with some models that we know that are evidence-based that we've seen in the literature. If a group presently has a transitional care in place, why should I duplicate that? And in turn, then maybe we can set up a financial arrangement to incentivize using that more so, and that that organization may be able to hire another FTE. Those are some granular examples I can give you. And then again, I have skin in the game with you. And it's not I'm just yeah, no. you, asking you to deliver. Yeah, and and as we transition to Rod, that was extremely helpful. I'll just make a statement, and you can react. The ability to take responsibilities that the plan was otherwise furnishing and having some of those be carved out so the providers do it instead puts even higher premium on interoperability because I presume when the plan does it, it's logged into the plan system. When the provider does it, it's logged into the provider system, and that can be an operational headache. Yes. Okay, so that – that's very kind and, and very helpful. We may come back to that if we have uh, time as we go through the rest of these to get into the uh, implications in the current world. But, but Rod, that's a nice handoff in a way to work that you're doing at Mercy just to think about those sorts of uh, due diligence steps that Diana so artfully uh, outlined. Would you mind first introducing us to Mercy uh, Health Physicians Network and a bit about uh, your role? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thanks for uh, joining us, folks. And Appreciate Care Journey and uh, Becker's inviting me. And hopefully, the things I'm going to talk about today aren't new to any of you, but maybe reinforcements of the things you're doing, the good things you're doing. So, a little bit about myself I'm the Chief Operating Officer with Mercy Health Physicians. That's our physician arm within uh, Bon Secours Mercy Health. So a little very quick overview of Bon Secours Mercy Health. We're a faith based organization that is divided within four groups, basically on the East Coast of the United States, and our fourth group being over in uh, Ireland. We have uh, 52 hospitals and 2,600 employed providers. To just kind of give you some scopes, we're one of the top five largest uh, faith-based nonprofit uh, health systems in the United States. As far as what my role is, you know, we're a large medical group, like I mentioned, 2,600 employed uh, providers. We have a shared governance model uh, with the system approach and a system board with uh, local leadership and local physician leadership and local boards that actually make uh, decisions that impact not only the system or ministry, as we call it, but also within our local uh, markets. A few years ago, we moved to a compensation model, a standard model for all our providers, moving away from a, an employment agreement to basically a letter agreement that allows for flexibility and is governed by a physician compensation committee. So, again, kind of physician-led. And uh, it's really focused uh, moving away from, as Diana mentioned, fee-for-service or productivity toward value-based. So we outline it when we meet with a new physician and talking about it, it looks like a tree in different colors of the tree with more of those leaves changing, changing to gold, which represents value-based care. So as we enter more risk agreements, more uh, value-based population health type metrics, the, compens- the revenue we bring in as an organization is more at risk and more based on quality and goals. And likewise, our physicians are um, uh, are representative that way as well as how they're compensated. Uh, specifically in my role, I'm here, I live in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, I'm responsible for a medical group of 350 providers within uh, one of our um, groups that I mentioned earlier. Again, we have a local board. Going back to that agreement, you know, as far as acceptance and how do physicians feel about accepting uh, contracts that are based on maybe things that they don't control. So you might be a cardiologist and, you know, part of your compensation is based on mammography outcomes. Well, when we went live on this in January of 2017, 100% of our primary care physicians moved over to this model. Went live about a year and a half ago for specialists. About two-thirds of them right now are on that. In just beginning of this year, advanced practitioners went on that same model and they're beginning to join it. What allowed us, I guess, to be successful where they had faith to make that leap is we invested years ago in analytics and uh, business intelligence, which allowed us at at the medical group level, at least, to produce a monthly balanced scorecard. Within that, it's kind of quality metrics, what I mentioned before, around a mammography or a pneumovax or depression screening around a patient experience. We definitely want to hear the voice of the customer and understand what we're doing right and and encourage that and, and we're uh, recognize and reward that 
understand what we're not doing well and need to improve. And other things you would expect in a, in a scorecard like coding, volumes like RVUs, new patients. I think what's unique about us is when we did this several years ago, this isn't something that's handed out or emailed to each of our physicians on a monthly basis. This is something that's available to the entire organization. So you could go onto our intranet and all 2,600 of these employed uh, providers uh, you can access their scorecards. So we went to full transparency a number of years ago. I think the only way you can do that successfully, and Diana mentioned this a few moments ago, is building trust. So you have to be able to communicate, indicate why you're sharing this data. It's not to shame someone, it's to recognize and to learn and grow and develop from that. And then ongoing validation of the data, again, to build that trust, you, you know, the doctors in particular, they're gonna dig into that to make sure it's, it's accurate. And that's not something you do initially with the build, but it's an ongoing effort to ensure that that's correct and appropriate data that you're sharing with them. So what we did kind of get into today's topic where we made a shift a number of years ago is focus on population health and immersing ourselves in risk contracts and utilizing data and information, in particular claim data, to leverage that and to make and drive change. So as an example, four years ago, or I should say five years ago, 4% of our total revenues as an organization were based on risk agreements. Uh, fast forward to today, it's actually 23%. So, I, you know, from my standpoint, wow. that's a pretty monumental jump in, uh, you know, a five-year time span. And it also shows that the investment we made in that and the risk we're willing to take or faith we have in our investment and the resources and infrastructure we built to, to be able to sustain that. So the question might be, how do you, how did you, how did you do that? So we have a clinically integrated network, part of our ACO, and that's kind of seen hand in glove within our medical group. So we have shared leadership, whether it be administratively or, or from a physician standpoint, medical directorship standpoint, and again, that hand in glove approach. So what we've done is the CIN, our clinically integrated network, seen as an extension of our practice. So we have care coordinators embedded in our practice, diabetic educators, transition to care coordinators, again, kind of touching on what uh, Diana mentioned a little while ago around uh, that transition from hospital to home to ensure those patients, want, before they leave the hospital, have everything they need to be successful when they get home and then getting them in to see their doctor uh, within that first week, making sure they, in leveraging social workers, which is the next kind of resource to ensure that any barriers and, uh, and, and things of that nature to prevent uh, you know, issues or resolve. And what we stood up as well as prevention clinics. So you could come in in, in in a given day and get your mammography, get your flu shot, get your annual well visit, visit all packaged in, uh, into one kind of visit to make best use of individuals' times. And we're leveraging virtual health more and more. You know, so there's been, there's been positives and negatives to that. So I know one of the questions uh, you know, asked prior to the call is, you know, missteps. So a number of years ago, I think it was five or six years ago, we launched our own health plan called HealthSpan. And uh, that did not go too well for, uh, for us. And we course corrected and realized we should not be in the insurance game and we should work with, our, uh, with the carriers, with our commercial partners and not necessarily try to be one or compete against one. So kind of going back to the, the revenues being at risk here in Ohio. So that's our largest region. And again, obviously that's where I'm based here in Youngstown. We have 192,000 uh, covered lives under our Medicare Shared Savings Program. And then in addition to that, we have uh, tens of thousands, I don't have an exact number, that are either under Aetna, United, Humana, or Cigna uh, risk contracts that we have here, not only in the state of Ohio, but in, you know, across our organization. You know, you know, so how do we interact or how do we relate to the payers? Each of our four groups that I yeah. mentioned has a CINO, which is a chief clinical integration officer. And they meet uh, quarterly, if not more regularly, but at least quarterly with the with the payers to work on shared objectives. So when we went back 10 years ago, when we kind of began this journey, you know, we might have had nine health plans and each had 10 particular quality goals they wanted us to focus on. So, you know, you're looking at 90 particular, in, you know, individual things you needed to focus on for a person, which obviously is not pragmatic. And, uh, you know, you almost had a, a you know, not the right way of practicing medicine. Okay, this is a Humana patient. What am I supposed to do for this person versus a Anthem patient? That's just not good care. So, you know, a lot of the work they do when they regularly meet is aligning those goals to whittle it down from 90 to kind of what it is today where there's kind of uniformity around each of those plans. On a more granular level, I mentioned our care coordinators. They work on a day-to-day -day basis with care coordinators with the different payers, including, the, you know, um, the Medicare 
uh, Medicare programs and Medicaid programs uh, as well. So we're not duplicating work. If they have resources within a particular plan with care coordinators, uh, we'll defer that to them and, and to manage that so we're able to hit the broader population of patients. I guess where this, where this rubber all hits the road is I think the infrastructure we've, we've created over the last decade or so has led us to be a more nimble organization, and that's uh, most relevant to what we're dealing with right now. Uh, here in uh, Northeast Ohio, we've been it's kind of more or less the epicenter for the COVID crisis here in the state of Ohio. So that's allowed us to change course, course correct very quickly on meeting the community needs where what we've done here locally, again, amongst the 350 providers that are part of the medical group I mentioned that I'm responsible for, we've been able to very quickly, within a day's notice, repurpose our primary care providers, and we've grouped them into one of three categories. They're either staffing flu clinics, and we have three flu clinics that are just for COVID or respiratory uh, illness patients. Me and our consolidated practices, so we were able to shutter about half our primary care practices within a day's notice and move doctors and, and APCs and staff around to see the well patients or well sick, if that's such a word. And then the other grouping that we needed to stand up more in our hospital uh, service to provide relief for our hospitalists that are covering the uh, COVID clinics. So we were able to do that quickly. And we were also able to leverage data in the uh, infrastructure I mentioned early, earlier in analytics to understand what's going on, how do we allocate resources, what's the next wave of patients, what do we need to do to be proactive to address the community needs and not reactive? And then maybe most important is uh, leveraging the work around what we've done around population health to leverage virtual health. Whereas right now we're trying to push about three quarters of our outpatient visits to virtual health via video visits and the like. Uh, and we stood that up within a less than a week's notice uh, to, to accommodate patient needs and, again, not bring them in when they don't when they want to more at risk by, uh, by traveling into a physical site and put, even putting our caregivers at risk. So I think the work we've done uh, really has allowed us to deal with crisis as it arrives and, and the proof's in the pudding in the last couple of weeks. So um, that's kind of a little bit of our experience here within uh, Bon Secours and, and Mercy Health. Rod, Rod, that was uh, extraordinarily helpful. C can I just peel the onion back on, on three areas? And let's start with the first. It sounds to me like you built the standardized chassis from comp model to staffing uh, to sort of infrastructure and reporting. When you do that, uh, it, it assumes that uh, information is coming to you in a, in a consistent way. I, I wonder, you know, as you do that, uh, you know, you still have fee for service in 77%, uh, you've, which has denials and, you know, overturn rates and all the headaches that we know in the traditional revenue cycle. You've got comp models that might be different, uh, e even if you're able to negotiate the, the measures from 90 plus to, to far fewer operationally, they, they may reward you differently. H how do you establish that standardized comp model uh, and some of those other features when you don't have the same uh, incoming uh, data or cash from the same way? How, how do you handle that mismatch in the interim period, Rod? Is that just the institution just takes the risk and says we're going to do it, even if it costs us money in that deal? How, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, a little bit. There's no doubt moving to this model, we call it the prime model, is, is cost us more. But I think it's the right thing to build our infrastructure. We believe our medical groups, the foundation, we're kind of the blood that pumps, that keeps the body alive. So, you know, we understand what that looks like. And there is still a strong component of the comp model that is based on productivity. So there is that, that piece of it, the fee-for-service world. But the model itself lends itself to changing on an annual basis without having to open up agreements and amend things or uh, stuff of that nature. So there's the fluidity in it that allows for it to change and adapt and adjust quickly and then we have comp committees that are again representative of physicians elected physicians in each of our regions that help guide those decisions so we kind of understood we were going out on a limb to a degree but at the same time this is where the future held and we believe that that infrastructure we're building around this and the investment in it is worth it and i think so far it's it's proven itself the, the, the second thread, if I could, uh, and then we're going to turn to our friends at Privy. Let me do second and then third. On the issue of um, 
implementing the scorecards that are more on the value-based side, which requires you to incorporate some of that claims data that you mentioned from the outside world, how much trust is there on whatever uh, comp component is tied to things that are derived from sort of external data that may not be generated by your internal uh, EHR system? Have you crossed any, any, any successes there? Or is that a work in progress you'd like to comment about? How do you blend the externally sourced data with your internal data to show doctors you're better or worse and you get paid differently as a result? I'm just curious if there's any yeah. uh, hope if that's working or is it just painful or how, how do you think about it? Well, as it relates to the comp piece, right now we're just using internal data. We use external data yep. uh, like claims data to supplement things or reinforce things or looking at it differently. So we're at least trying to put our, at least now, uh, the face in our own analytics, our own um, data, if you will, as far as how it affects anybody's paycheck. Uh, we, you know, we want to make sure what we have we're 100% sure of when it, you know, again, affects, you know, what they get in their, in their payday yeah. every couple weeks. But I think, you know, we're getting, we're able to get more things externally. I think the relationships are, aren't ad, as adversarial as they used to be. So as uh, these relationships with different payers develop, and there's different, you know, depending on the payer, there's different levels of, uh, of where that relationship is. And I think over time, as it becomes hopefully more shared goals in driving for the same outcomes, I feel more comfortable in how you use that data or how you apply it maybe. Well, and that leads to my last question, and, and that gets to some of the, uh, what your comments are about the response to COVID. By the way, to be applauded, what you just described in, in terms of the restructuring of the delivery uh, model that itself is a separate webinar, and you clearly have emerged as a potential best practice. But the reaction there is more on on the in the value based world. Some of these moves, like the move to virtual, and some of the other aspects, the the separating the well click sick visits from the others. It seems like you'd want to do those anyway in in the move to value. Could you just maybe say a word or two in the end about the lasting change that some of these moves you're making now might hold? Uh, not that we want to celebrate this crisis for having helped us move faster, but does that mean that virtual will be a common part of the operating model? And can you comment a bit about that? And then we're going to turn to our yeah, to sure. Yeah. yeah, real good question. We're being very intentional and thinking through, even though we're reacting and responding very quickly to this crisis, but be, being very intentional because we know that things we're doing now are going to change things for the future. We want to build it and do it right virtual health being uh, absolutely the foundation for that. I see less bricks and mortars for us in the future years. You know, with the, the, the crunch of uh, physician shortage, maybe we don't need as many doctors because we're able to leverage them differently. Through virtual health, we're able to do more without pushing them to the edge and improving their quality of life and reducing burnout and all that in the future. So I think a lot of the things we're doing right now in the hospital, in the outpatient setting, are things that are maybe going to be best practices and here to stay, and, and we just got to learn from that and use a crisis to um, uh, to build a better future. Yeah, Rod, we're going to come back and more about what you established there. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, to, to to round us out in our final case study, uh, if I could ask uh, Mark and Greg to share a bit about uh, Privia to the extent that we learned about uh, a payer. Uh, interested in this with Diana and now a provider who's building an infrastructure while the machinery around their contracts is ch are changing. Um, Privia is in, in many, many markets around the country. Mark, could you give us a quick overview about uh, Privia? And then we can use that scale as a way to introduce the conversation back again on lessons learned and best practices. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Nish. Uh, thanks. Yeah, Care Journeys and Beckers as well, like Rob said. And Real quick, Rob, just to be clear, I, I wish I was in your market. You sound very progressive, so I'm going to talk to you after this. That aside, let me give you some <laughs> background on Privia. Yeah, I'm ready for Ohio. Anyway, uh, some background on Privia. We're, we're a medical group. Think about us really as that. We've got a lot of services that wrap a medical group. We'll explain those briefly. Um, just to give you some uh, background, I have a couple slides that will set the stage that come from our providers. But we are a medical group, seven regions, 2,600 providers. And when you think about us, think about us as 70%, their round numbers are primary care. So we're very, very engaged with physicians. Um, as a medical group, we have people that have been with us now for five years, and just about every Tuesday, we're bringing new physicians on. So what we have to do as an organization is think about where our physician partners are in this transformation of value. And, and in the delivery of healthcare, the experience uh, it, itself is where they are. 
but we have to be very flexible to try to meet the physician where they are so they can take care of their patients and think about the journey we're trying to pull them through. The way we do that journey is, is, is very important, a couple of key aspects for us. We have a single platform, technology platform. It's an Athena-based platform that we've built some capabilities around, um, and that's core to us. We wrap that with talent that's in the market. Uh, you heard Rob talk about some of the resources he used to connect with the payers and connect with the patients. We build a team very similar to that, that 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 connects with payers in a market. Greg will talk about that in just a second. And we built uh, within the markets resources that connect with our doctors. So uh, I, I unfortunately have lost connection. So if you could go to the first slide, Anish, I'd appreciate yep. it. And what you're seeing there, the only reason I want to share this to you, this is what our physician, that says previous vision for value-based care, actually this is what yep. the physicians developed, the, the 2,600 physicians. So those of you out there, you can read these. But some key things are important. The very first one, and it's there for a reason. This is what the doctors tell us tell us when we're looking for uh, partners in the, in, in the payer world. It's look, looking for like-minded uh, payer partners. If you, I'm just going to skip you around to, to a few of these. Just like Rob mentioned, there's a provider compensation model. Our providers strongly believe if we help you create value, that's asking us to do more work work, we'll gladly do that because this at the end of the day is what's good for the patients and that's what we care about most. That That's why we're in business. But also, if we aren't able to create value, share that value with us. And then if you want us to, we can talk about this, but similar to what Rob did, we are independent physicians, so more of, an, a, revenue, of a traditional revenue and expense model. But when it comes to value-based care, the physician groups through a governance model uh, uh, d determines how that distribution occurs through that value-based spectrum. Number four is the most important bullet. I'll skip the rest. You can read all those on another day, but it's physician leadership. So what we have, the governance model, that's a dyad model. We have business people, a business person connected with physicians throughout the organization. So in every market and even at the national level, we have national committees that are, that are driven by our physicians, again, medical group, with a business partner, as it goes through the organization, that same structure is there. So we have a board, we have a, a region level where we have medical directors and diet business partners thinking about the operations around value-based care, around clinical needs, around the, the actual operations of the office. At the end of the day, keeping the lights on, especially in this crisis we're in right now, is vitally important. So we deal with all of those things, and we do that through a physician governance structure, because at the end, of the end of the day, if I stood up and stood in front of a doctor and say, I need you to do something, it doesn't matter. What's important is a doctor-to-doctor -doctor communication, and we set that up through our governance model. If you go to the next slide, I'm not going to go deep on this next slide, but what this is, it's our, it's our racetrack, which shows you how we engage with um, the providers in our single platform. I'm not even going to explain anything on the page, but there's a basic core to this, which is Athena. And then if you were to look through those, an example, you'll see huddle reports, the value-based care tool. It basically says we have a patient come in today, and there's a single lens report that says, here are the metrics that we want you to focus on to close gaps in care, documentation of, of conditions. It gives them at least vitals and some key aspects to it, but a single lens to prepare the physician to drive value, drive toward those kind of value-based care indicators. The last thing I'll say, and I'll punt it to Greg for this, is that those value-based care in indicators, Rob just mentioned this, I think he mentioned the number 90. Uh, my big ask on this call, and Anisha, you know this is coming, is we're a provider group. I see doctors day in, day out, and I see what provider abrasion looks like. What we're trying to do as best we can is remove some of the, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to use bad words on a phone call, right? So some of the process that it, that's just driving the doctors crazy in terms of day-to-day um, -day non clinical type things we're asking them to do. So we, we try to narrow the scope of what we focus on and deliver that to the providers. And then Greg, if you want to talk about how we do that through the JOC process and all that, do you want to pick up from here? Sure. Well, hey, Mark, thanks, Mark. Mark. Can I yeah. Hey, Greg, can you give me one second? I want to grab Mark for Absolutely. one comment. I knew it was coming. I want to prepare for it. Here's the question. 
uh, and actually some of the comments in the Q&A reflect this. I'm going to sort of summarize them and get your reaction. In the traditional fee-for-service arrangement, the denials, the prior off, a lot of that administrative overhead, that overhead in theory, if I hear you correctly, Mark, should go away or be dialed down as we dial up some of these quality measures. I'm presuming that we're not really in the day-to-day -day world seeing the dialing down of some of those other aspects. Could you just comment about the current state as you see it when you make that comment? Are you seeing areas of negotiation where you can dial down uh, prior auth and, and uh, any, name any other administrative burden uh, that would you would characterize as a, a less value add when you're moving towards uh, value? Quick comment on that, Mark? Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I'll answer with this. We're trying. Greg and I do this day in, day out. So we've, we've got an entire infrastructure behind the medical group, 2,500 doctors. Quick example, on Greg's team, he has 14 uh, data analytics um, uh, led by PhD data analytics team that's taking incoming data and driving it. That's a very small example to think about. Don't think of us as the medical group down the street from you. It's a big organization with a collective business experience behind it. The reason that's important is this, when we're having these conversations, to your point, Anish, with payers, we can handle some of this. A lot of our conversation is tell us what you want and then get out of our way, let us do it. That's a, that's yep. a big, big step for a payer. Uh, a lot of that gets mm -hmm. into why do we have these speed bumps we need to jump, right? So go ahead. You got you a me, question, Diana, Anish? Yeah. yeah. Can yeah. I comment on that? And the answer to Please, it is you may. Yeah, taking away some of those preauthorization requirements. But let's go back how you started the conversation, and I think Privy is doing this as well. By the simple use of that EMR, and when we have that bidirectional flow of information, we have found with that engagement with those groups that will share that information, the need for prior off the old traditional way goes away because we see the same clinical information and the need for that services. Does that make sense? Because you see in real time information and that's what we're looking at to be able for the member or the patient to get what he or she needs because prior off has time limits, right? And we talk it pre-cert non-urgent, pre-cert urgent and all that kind of stuff, but we want to be able to take away That's the that. Part, this, this negotiation on the call, Mark and Greg, is exactly, and maybe Greg, this is a hand off to you, but it strikes me that that's what I think this moment allows us to do. The generic here have access to all of my data feels like a overdoing it, but an, a, enabling the payer to get a limited set to what they're entitled to those kinds of fine-tuning techniques now can be done with the uh, API standards. Uh, maybe, yeah. Greg, this could hand off to you in the operations of any of this. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, it seems like we have four minutes left. Um, yeah, I, I'm an actuary by training and came from the health plan side. But for the physician group, we, you know, we are in collectively 56 value-based deals across the country. And so we take in payer-specific data uh, in multiple geographies from, from multiple payers. And, and as, as all the previous people have mentioned, our challenge is how do we, we have to balance the trying to push our physicians to handle patients, they, they'll consistently say we handle patients the same way and treat them consistently for quality, cost control, and, and just good health. And how do we balance that with the myriad of contractual commitments we're in? Um, we're fortunate to have a single platform medical record. And so we live the daily dance of you know, trying to promote consistent measures and practices that, that we generate from our system and can share with the payers versus having to, you know, live within our contractual commitments to those payers. And, you know, everyone, every payer thinks their mousetrap and their legacy data is the best. And, and we just have to work through, you know, 
surviving the day with our contractual commitments and balancing and, and driving consistency across that. And, and the main tool for that is our joint operating committee meetings with the payers. And we typically get on quarterly. And, you know, Rod and Dan has mentioned this, that, that some payers are more advanced than others, but it's a great place to get on a periodic conversation, share bi-directional data, and things we're seeing across multiple payers, what have you. And, you know, just over time, um, I think we'll be able to move toward more consistent measures and standards versus the specifics that each of the payers uh, have through all of their legacy systems. And, and just before you, as we get to the last couple of minutes, I'm, I'm taking the Q&A and trying to incorporate them into this. Just as a practical matter, when you sit down and you do track some of that uh, low value added sort of activity, maybe that's in the form of these denials or prior auths, it, 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 have you found a way to crack through? Like Diana's point is, if you gave me direct access to the raw data, I may dial down some of the denials. Are you seeing that type of trade? Uh, or, or, or are you seeing receptivity to an idea like that? And if so, please share any, any, any lessons learned or, or suggestions around it. We, we do see some traction. Um, you know, the, the primitive form for which it starts is, you know, they have a quality me measure and, you know, we're not meeting it on a claims only basis. And, you know, then we have the conversation, hey, look, what if we give you a supplemental data file extract from our EMR and, you know, we send it to them, they, they digest it. And then, you know, then they see, oh, wow, you guys do have great quality. You know, then it opens the door to the conversation. Hey, can, can we just set up, uh, you know, better data processes and, and methods and handle this more seamlessly going forward? So I, I think it is possible in, in that regard. And that's just a small example of how we kind of progress on the journey. Yeah, my, my takeaway on this, thank you so much for that, Greg. Uh, my takeaway is across all three of these case studies, we, we've heard the importance of setting up these agreements appropriately with, with a due diligence step uh, to determine the scope of services that party A versus party B should take on responsibility for. Some type of quarterly shared analytics, aggregation metrics and dialogue, which feels more reporting and strategy and then this most recent piece about real-time data uh, in order to reduce some of the day-to-day -day friction, which might result in, it, maybe this is more of a wishful thinking, but, but for now, it, the theory would be uh, reduce the day-to-day -day, uh, denial and prior auth issues while uh, enabling some of the kind of, you know, this patient's a good candidate for this uh, uh, intervention. Um, we are at the 2 o'clock hour, and, uh, East Coast time, and I want to be respectful to get everybody back to schedule. We have recorded this uh, session. I want to thank everyone for being very kind and gracious for participating in the Q&A on the online, and uh, certainly look forward to following up on what we hope will be an emerging discussion over the year of what a best practice template for those three categories of payer-provider partnerships would look like. Uh, I will turn it back to our friends at Be uh, Becker's McKenzie, if you want to wrap us up. Perfect. That concludes our presentation. I want to thank Anish, Rod, Diana, Mark, and Greg for such an insightful conversation today. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you all for attending. Be safe. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to reach out to each of you. That